Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investment topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Chris Bloomstrand, Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here is your host, John Mihaljevic. Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to episode three of this uh, new podcast. Uh, we do have a name uh, at this point. This week in Intelligent Investing, uh, we are also available on iTunes and some other podcast apps. Uh, slowly but surely, I think we'll be available on any app, including Spotify. So just bear with us for another couple of weeks on that. Uh, today, we uh, don't have with us Elliot Turner. He couldn't be here, unfortunately. But we do have Phil Ordway and Chris Bloomstrand uh, with a couple of uh, interesting and timely uh, topics. Uh, so, Chris, I'll turn it to you first. Uh, I know you've been following uh, insurance company earnings and you want to talk about COVID losses and also preview the Berkshire quarter. So uh, that's, I think, uh, something many of us are looking at this week. So go ahead. Yeah, thanks, John. And shout out to Elliot. It looks like, um, I guess they had a pretty wicked storm in Connecticut. He had said they had trees down everywhere. And I thought maybe they had gone down to the Carolinas and got hit by the hurricane. So in any event, um, look forward to having him back next week. Also, condolences out to, um, I don't know if you guys saw the news, but Warren Buffett's sister Doris passed away a couple days ago. So heartfelt mm. condolences to the Buffett family. She yep. uh, made it to 92 and did a lot of charitable good and sounds like it was a uh, Awesome, awesome lady. So, true loss. Yeah, I thought, um, you know, lurching right in, that, that it was a lot that, that I guess we contemplated talking about. And timely on the front of Berkshire, you know, I, I write the long letter every year and spend a lot of time in, in January in the first week or so, a couple of weeks of February, you know, working through a lot of themes in the Berkshire letter. And I really try to get what I think the earning power looks like for the business kind of at a, at a run rate at that point in time. And generally during the course of the year, you know, I've done so much work on the business. There are so many moving parts in the business that I don't do a lot of maintenance with Berkshire. You know, my intrinsic value number it should grow roughly in line with the earning power of the business, which because they don't pay a dividend should replicate the, you know, the underlying return on equity of the business. And I make a lot of accounting adjustments to try to get to what I would call normalized you know, free cash, if you will, earning power. So, you know, here, here we find ourselves kind of mid-year through 2020, which has got, it's by far the most unusual, you know, six months of, of my investing career, you know, going on 30 years now. And thinking through what Berkshire kind of looks like at year end, you know, the stock has been really beat up during the pandemic, went into the year at a level that, that we found very undervalued. And, you know, I think with a lot of the insurers and given the fact that they had and have a lot of the big money center banks in the common stock portfolio and the insurance companies, you know, they had the airline investments, you know, you overlay just the stock market performance of the property casualty insurance and reinsurance group. And then, you know, overlay that with the bank group. And, you know, the stock has been, you know, unmercifully beat up, you know, it was down as much or more than the, the overall S&P 500 at March 23rd has not staged the same level of recovery. You know, so, you know, at 6.30, the stock portfolio uh, was still down about 9.5%. Berkshire was down something like, I want to say 23% at quarter end at 6.30. It's still down about 9% for the year. It's had a big move up. You know, this whole reinsurance group and insurance group have had big moves up. And I think there are reasons for that. You know, I talked about some of that last week, but, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't see a lot of diminution to the earning power of Berkshire Hathaway. And you've got these kind of big moving parts and, and buckets of value as we look at it. And as is Mr. Buffett, you know, kind of thinks through how the operations of the business can be viewed, you know, through the lens of an outside shareholder. And, you know, starting with 
you know, the rail group, which is, you know, outside of national indemnity, you know, the, the second most important and, and largest business within Berkshire, you know, you, you, the, the rails have all reported, you know, Union Pacific, CSX, uh, Canadian National, the Canadian rails. And, you know, I've talked about this before, but, you know, unlike, uh, you know, airlines, you know, rails have a lot of variable cost in the cost structure. And you kind of look at, at, you know, how the, how the businesses have performed first quarter, you didn't have a lot of downturn. And you could say the same thing about the economy because you only had two weeks of really the economic shutdown. And then you got to the second quarter where trade, which is, has been weak for the last two years, you know, started to stabilize during the second quarter, but, you know, top, top to bottom, you know, if, if you look at revenues for the major class one rails, you know, they're all down between 20 and call it 27%. You know, I look at car loadings on a regular basis and, you know, the Burlington Northern uh, within Berkshire uh, has been weaker than most. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, Burlington's revenues down by 25 plus percent, maybe 27 percent for the quarter. You would expect, given the degree that, 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 that they have a lot of variable costs in the cost structure, that earnings would roughly match that. And so, you know, on a normalized run rate basis, Instead of doing pre seven billion, let's say in pre-tax income and five and a half billion in, in after-tax, the quarter is going to shave probably five hundred million plus off the earnings of Berkshire. But you know, if you look at, at at how the stocks of the publicly traded competitors have performed, you know they're all you know darn near back to all-time highs. Some are at new highs. You know, I think you've got this twenty-five percent decline in economic activity. You're going to have some shape of recovery. And, you know, if you discount the entire tail of the earnings stream, then, you know, even with a 25% haircut on the top line and the bottom line, it's just not permanent. And, you know, here in the last month or so, you can really see on a granular basis, a big improvement. It looks like, you know, revenues and car loadings are all maybe down 10% on a year over year basis. So I, I just don't think there's any diminution in the long run earning power of the Burlington Northern. And that's, you know, an asset that's worth $100 billion inside of Berkshire. The energy groups, the utility groups, if you look at all the utilities that have, have reported already, you know, revenues in some cases are down 5%, 4%. You've got a couple that were down 10. Again, a lot of variable costs in the cost structure. Um, you know, I, I would not expect really any in material, you know, beyond maybe 5%, decline in the earning power with, within Berkshire's big, you know, diversified energy group, the four U.S. utilities, the U.K. utility, all of the, the various distribution assets. You know, I've got that business valued at 50 to $60 billion, call it $55 billion, and, you know, doing, you know, roughly two and a half to three and a half billion uh, on a net income basis, depending on how you look at, at the degree to which they're not paying taxes on a cash basis versus a, a gap basis. So, yeah, I, I think that that portion of the business, which is you know a goodly chunk of the business uh, of Berkshire, is you know completely unharmed. The manufacturing service retail group, which has been problematic for some time, you know, is a combination of you know some older businesses that have suffered a lot of competition. You know, all of the the, the retail businesses, Precision Cast Parts, which is the biggest business in that collective group, um, you know, was suffering mightily with their their turbine business you know now you've got the jet engine manufacturer and aircraft manufacturer industries you know flat on their back so you you, you kind of go through the big businesses and the moving parts marmon uh, lubrizol you know that 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 collective group of msrs would normalize earning power at 10 billion dollars they're gonna be way down you think about the retailers within the operation you know i look at, at retailers that we follow that are publicly traded that have announced you've got revenues down 50, 60, 70, 80% for a lot of them. You know, we own Costco and Dollar General. They're essential. They've been up and running. You know, in cases like those, they're, 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 they're full top line growth. But, you know, if you're a jeweler, if you're Borsheim's or Ben Bridge in any of the other retail operations, you know, you've got next to nothing as far as revenue re revenues go. And so, you know, a business that was going to do maybe two and a half billion dollars net income after tax on a quarterly basis for this second quarter. I wouldn't be surprised to see that group post collective losses. you you do have a lot of fixed costs there. You, know, you can't get away from depreciation charges. So, you know, you've got probably, you know, two and a half plus billion dollar cut. 
again, I don't think, you know, depending on the shape of the recovery, that you have any permanent diminution of value, but the earning, you know, the current earning power of that group is, is harmed and will be harmed until we're clear of the virus and we've got the economy back on, you know, some better semblance of strong footing. And so moving on to the group that I really wanted to talk about today, and that's kind of this misunderstood reinsurance world. You know, the the collective of Berkshire's insurance operations to me still make up 45% of the value of the company. You know, you look at, you know, Geico, which is by far the largest, you know, writer by premium volume of the group, but requiring very little capital. In admitted private passenger auto insurance, you can write $3 of premium for every dollar of capital. So, you know, there's, you know, Geico's number two market share gaining on State Farm. I think they've lost some ground to Progressive in the last few years, but still it's a wonderful insurance company that requires somewhere on the order of $15 billion of capital. Well, all of Berkshire Hathaway's statutory capital in the insurance operations is on the order of $215 billion. The stock portfolio, which largely resides inside the insurance operations, as of today, has recovered its losses for the year. It's now up a half percent, large part thanks to Apple. I think the stock portfolio would be down on the order of 10% still for the year. But, you know, the gain in Apple has just been astronomical. But, you know, if you move aside from Geico that requires very little capital to write large premium volume, you've got the reinsurance operations and then you've got the specialty businesses, which write commercial insurance. You know, the commercial businesses are going to write about $10 billion in premiums. The reinsurance operations, which is National Indemnity and, and Gen Ray, are going to write on the order of $16, 17 $18 billion. Well, you know, the capital required to write on the specialty lines is similar to, to what, what, what you'd see required in, in auto insurance. So, you know, of that, call it $10 billion in annual premium. You really don't need much more than $10 billion max, you know, probably $5 billion conservatively stated to write that degree of premium volume. Um, so, you know, the vast majority of, of capital inside of the insurance operations is in the reinsurance group. And, you know, if you've got a business that does call it $17 billion in premiums, you know, if you were a typical underwriter, you know, you would, you would, uh, you know, write, let's say, well, if you look at industry data, you know, you've got all reinsurance global capital is about $600 billion. And $100 billion of that, $100 billion of that is kind of your exotic specialty product, your insurance link securities, your cat bonds. So, you know, you've got $500 billion of traditional capital. You've got $100 billion of, of exotic capital. You know, Berkshire's capital uh, is on the order of $200 billion. So it's, you know, 40% of the capital of the traditional insurers, a third of the capital in all of global reinsurance. And Berkshire's premium volume on an industry that, that does, and I'm talking reinsurance industry now, will do about $225 billion in, in premium volume per year. Berkshire is only writing less than 10% of that. So you've got a business that does less than 10% of the premium volume and has on the order of a third to 40% of the capital. It's, it, it's such an outlier in the industry that when you talk about Berkshire's balance sheet, especially in the insurance world, being Fort Knox, that's how it's Fort Knox. And that's how Berkshire can have, you know, a $230, $240 billion stock portfolio against statutory capital of, you know, a couple hundred billion dollars. Um, you know, it's an extraordinary thing. And so you think about how losses are developing. And I've been keeping a running list of the, the reinsurers as they report. You know, you kind of go through, um, you know, early on, you, 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 we had to get comfortable. And I was on the phone for the first month, month and a half, one, once we really realized that you were deep into this COVID thing, you know, I was, on the, I was on the phone with everybody I knew in the industry trying to get a handle on what was obviously going to be a problem in business interruption and also an event cancellation. And then you were going to get issues with, with surety bonds, you know, non-performance of construction contacts, contracts. You would have some, from some DNO, you know, issues and, and, and claims filed, but, you know, your, your business interruption was going to be a big deal. And you saw some lawsuits filed very early on by various insureds for non-payment by the insurance industry. And, you know, my take in my, my conclusion through all of the, the, the digging and reading and talking that we did was it really was not going to be a material event. It, it was going to likely last a long time to resolve the fact that, 
pandemics just aren't covered. You know, business interruption is a property claim. It requires property damage. You know, that's not to say you're not going to see a gazillion lawsuits. They're going to be litigated over some long period of time. There are test cases going on right now in the UK. There, there are lawsuits filed in the United States. But all in, you know, you've got the industry now setting aside reserves. And, uh, you know, Berkshire set aside a few hundred million dollars uh, for claims actually filed in the first quarter, but also incurred but not reported, which is the preponderance. So I've got this running tally now of insurers and losses that have developed. And, you know, the numbers are, are getting up to where they're pretty serious. You know, you're 20 plus billion dollars, maybe $25 billion as of today. And we knew early on companies like Cincinnati had written badly. A bunch of the companies on the Lloyd syndicate had issues in the way their policies were written and didn't have proper exclusions. Um, FM, was going to have issues. And so you've seen a lot more clarity now. And, you know, you, 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 you've had this full second quarter where economic activity was down. You've had a number of claims filed. Uh, you've got some IBNR that's developed. And again, it's 20 plus billion dollars. So, you know, the, the Swiss Ray announced a couple of days ago, uh, Mumenthaler, Christian Mumenthaler, who's the CEO, came out and said, you know, this thing could wind up being an $80 billion dollar loss event, which, you know, he, he, he said was manageable. Well, if you take Berkshire's, you know, $200 billion in capital away from the industry, $600 billion, now you're looking about at, at about 20% of insurance capital, which is not insignificant. The upside and the upshot, and I think the reason that these stocks have done so well in the last, call it month, going back to July 10, is you know, you talk to insurance brokers and you see how they're evolving and reporting. Pricing is just incredible. I mean, you're seeing prices growing on the order of 15% to 40% in the reinsurance markets. You, you, you had first glimpse of that in the, the, the reinsurance treaties in Japan in April. Prices were off the charts. Then you had the June and the July reinsurance treaties in the UK uh, and in the US. And, you know, prices for reinsurance way up. Prices for all these various commercial lines are way up. You know, auto insurance is a different animal in that Geico and Mercury General and Progressive, you know, these guys just don't have the same degree of losses because nobody's driving. And so when you measure frequencies, they're way down. Severities, turns out, go way up because people drive like maniacs uh, when there aren't as many people on the roads. And I've seen that firsthand in St. Louis. I mean, you've got just nonstop races when I happen to be out every now and then. But, you know, you're seeing, you know, either some form of, of credits to policyholders or, you know, Geico is, is um, effectively giving you credits prospectively. You know, some companies have written checks and sent them back to the insureds. But, you know, loss ratios are way, way down. And so, you know, that corner of property casualty insurance is not going to have a lot of pricing in the next year or two, just because, you know, until we get people driving again, there aren't a lot of losses. Uh, but, you know, these other, you know, business lines and commercial lines, pricing is just way up. And, um, you know, I think if you think on, the, you know, if you've got prices growing in the order of 20 or 30%, even if you have a kind of a worst case and, and, and you do have losses for the COVID of $80 billion, that 20% loss to industry capital will be replaced on fairly short order. And so I've got another running tally uh, and, and you have to do this because, you know, when you go back to the big hurricanes like Andrew back in the 90s, you, know, you wipe out the insurance industry, you wipe out the reinsurance industry, you recapitalize and pricing tends to be best after a pandemic or, or, or after a, a cat. Well, similarly, you know, pricing is really good, you know, during and after a pandemic. What's really interesting is all of these treaties that have been redone and policies are being rewritten are now expressly precluding COVID. So, if you have another pandemic or you have an extension of the COVID and this thing lasts another year or two or three years, it's really hard for insureds to get coverage. Nobody wants to write. The other thing that's really wild, and I'm on one hand disgusted and, you know, on one hand just bewildered, you know, you have all these companies quantifying what their COVID expected losses are going to wind up being. I have never seen single line items for societal disruption. Um, and it's obviously your riots and your looting. And the numbers are staggering. You know, if COVID's set asides have been on the order of 20 plus billion, 25 billion, I mean, you're going to wind up having, you know, three, four, five billion dollars in losses so far. And 
you know, I'm not sure any of your underwriters had, you know, a prepared for a pandemic, although we had SARS and the various others. You know, I don't think anybody has expected the kind of losses that could develop for uh, what, what's gone on, unfortunately gone on, you know, over the last, you know, couple months. It's, it, it's sad and, you know, it's remarkable to see the numbers actually flowing through as a line item uh, when companies are establishing the reserves for losses. In any event, what, I've, I've just, you know, yammered on too much. Why don't I see what you guys have to say and, you know, clarify, you know, fill in any color um, because, you know, this thing's still very much um, a nonlinear um, developing situation, uh, especially because we really don't have an idea as to when the economy is going to recover. And so, you know, these losses could, you know, be the you know, 25 billion could be the extent of it. You get to 80, um, you know, if things go really badly in the courts and you wind up on the, the steps of the Supreme Court and you get an adverse ruling, you know, you could have a lot of capital destroyed. But, you know, again, to my point, I think a lot of it gets recovered through price, which is pretty typical of the industry. And so the one thing you have to watch, and, I'm, and, and then I'll stop, one thing you really have to pay attention to is, is whether too much new capital winds up being formed and comes in. And so, you know, Ren Ray, you know, has, has raised one and a quarter billion on a couple of tranches. Hiscox has raised capital, A, because they needed to, but now they've got money set aside that they're waiting to uh, put out for bid until next year. Beasley, Lancashire, you know, you add it all up and, and you're starting to get some sizable numbers. At the margin, what's great is this insurance linked capital and, and some of this, this specialty insurance kind of at the margin in 2019 started to go away. You know, you had two or three, you know, two, two big years of hurricane losses and California wildfire losses. And after that degree of capital destruction, you would have expected to see more capital flow in and you didn't see it in the exotics. And so for that, you've got this kind of incredibly tight market today where traditional reinsurance is allowed to raise price and you don't have that much of a flood of new capital coming in in the exotic space. And so it would give me pause. I mean, I think most of these CEOs and CFOs, you know, these underwriters, when you talk to them and you listen to them on their earnings calls, think they have clarity for arguably the hardest insurance market they've seen in decades going on right now. They think it persists into the first half of next year. Well, if a flood of capital comes into the market here in the in, in the back half of the year, you know, you've got an issue. And I think the, I think the other issue, and, and, and I will fully stop, is uh, you really have a tail risk event. So think about it. If COVID has inflicted $25 billion, let's say, in losses in the first half, typically in, in, in reinsurance, you don't have big losses in the first half of the year. The first half is when you get fat because you don't have your named windstorms. Um, you know, those all come second half of the year. So the tail risk event here is if you have an aberrantly bad wind season and, you know, you look at the, the, the forecasters, you know, the outfits that predict whether you're going to have a good or a bad or a mild hurricane season, you know, the, the, the three collective outfits that, you know, make predictions based on weather patterns are suggesting that this stands to be a bad weather year. And, you know, if you've blown up that much capital for the COVID, and yeah, you're getting pricing, but if you have, you know, really bad storms or if you have fire that develops badly, again, a lot of those fire policies aren't being written it really could be bad for the industry, but kind of circling back to Berkshire, you can't harm Berkshire given the capital size of the business. So with that, I'll, I'll cease and desist. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I can chime in on the weather part of it. It's a, for no good reason, an interest of mine and I've paid attention to it over the years quite a bit. And it's actually very uh, interesting and timely right now. You mentioned poor Elliot and what happened. That actually was related to the hurricane that made landfall in North Carolina. It was no longer a hurricane, but it knocked out power to tens of millions of people all up and down the East Coast. It was pretty crazy. I mean, the craziest part of all is we're sitting here in early August, um, and that was already the sixth named storm to make landfall uh, in a season that really doesn't officially start until about five weeks ago. Um, there were there were named storms in May and June, which is very unusual. And so there's not as much as meteorology has improved and as much as the computing power has expanded, the ability to forecast the track of the storm uh, days and even weeks in advance, that that progress has been enormous over the past 10 and 20 years. The the intensity is is not, at landfall has not been quite as accurate. I mean, it's gotten better, but um, the track and the direction of the storm has been the, the major intent. And then if you look out beyond, the, those forecasts that you mentioned, 
um, about you know the season long storms. I mean, those forecasts are still at best kind of 55, 45 or 60, 40 propositions in terms of saying above average or average yeah. below average type seasons. But what is really interesting is without any predict- predictive ability, you can say that the leading correlation or the number one factor that correlates with an above average season is an above average activity in the early season, early months of the season. So the fact that we've seen a lot of activity not only in August, but even going back into July and June, bodes very poorly for further activity as we go into the heat of the season, which is really into August and September. Sea surface temperatures up and down the East Coast and the Caribbean are running well above normal. And then most importantly, second to that is is that there's very little wind shear to kind of disrupt and break up those storms once they form. So, you know, Buffett's always talked about the big one being a 50 or $100 million super catastrophe, um, something like Hurricane Andrew, Hurricane Katrina making indirect landfall in Miami, New Orleans, Tampa, uh, even New York and Long Island again, like Sandy, but but even worse this time. I mean, those, are, those types of scenarios are always in play, and this season is probably significantly more likely than any other in recent memory to, to see something like that play out. doesn't mean it will play out. It just means the odds have gone from – whatever they were before to something a little bit higher, you know, maybe in a given year, you've gone from one or 2% to three or 4% or something like that. And if it does happen, I'm with you. I don't know how much capital could flood into this industry quickly, but my uh, thought is it's probably a lot. There's just a massive amount of capital sitting around out there looking for these sort of non market, non economic correlated events, Um, whether it's specialty purpose reinsurance vehicles, whether it's insurance linked securities, um, whether it's other forms of capital coming directly in a corporate form, I would not want to bet my life on a massive market, a massive hardening of the market next year or beyond, because I'm just not sure that's, I mean, yeah, maybe you see COVID extend, maybe a, a couple of bad hurricanes throw in some earthquakes and fires too, maybe you would see it then. But otherwise, I would probably take the glass half empty on that. My guess is you would see it more in traditional reinsurance capital and less in the cat bond and the ILS markets, just in that, you know, you've got on the order of, I don't know, 15, 16 years of recorded data now for insurance linked securities. And if you look at the funds and the indices of, of the fund performance, it's not very good. I mean, annual returns right. have been something like four, four and a half percent since inception and in the last three years have been abysmal. And so for that, you have not seen you know, a continued growth, at least in that corner of the market capital has not been quick to come in. Um, there's just been a lot of folly. And so uh, you've not seen much yet this year, I think. And, you know, in that corner of the $100 billion, insurance links are about $40 billion. You've had issuance this year of about nine. So it has picked up and there is there is growth in capital there, you know, kind of relative to what you've seen prior year 2019. But, you know, the real money that's come in has come in, you know, kind of with the traditional reinsurers and it, it'll be interesting. Agreed. Yeah. The other part of it too, that is going to matter longer term to all these pools of capital. And I think this is probably implicit secondary to Buffett and IG Jane saying over the last several years that the reinsurance market was nowhere near as attractive as it's been in their heyday of prior decades was just the prospect of low rates. It's less of an issue for Berkshire, but it's a pretty significant issue for every other insurer out there. And, I certainly don't have an explicit forecast, but it wouldn't make me feel real good. Let's put it that way. Yeah, John, you have any thoughts on on the current state of the insurance reinsurance world? Well, you mentioned that nobody wants to write a pandemic insurance, uh, and and I like your view on is there just not a market there because it's so hard to predict and the severities are so high, or is it just a matter of price? Do you think there will be a growing uh, segment uh, there? Well, the the industry largely had it figured out after SARS. You know, you go back to 2002 and you take event cancellation policies. If you're staging a big sports contest or you're, you know, Super Bowl, you know, if you're the NFL or MLB, you know, the, the industry has compelled the the, the the purchase of a very expensive rider that was going to cover pandemic. So it went out of its way to not cover. And you look and, and ask, well, why are we playing, you know, basketball games in Orlando and hockey games in Canada? Well, none of these leagues bought the coverage. You know, it was purchased 
by Wimbledon. It was purchased by the RNA, the folks that run the British Open. And, you know, guess what? They had coverage and they're not going to host the tournaments this year. But everybody else is trying to figure it out and trying to run. I think, you know, the reality is a lot of, a lot of those policies, you know, your, your, your commercial business insurance policies that wound up being reinsured in a lot of cases, and th- this was really seen in the London markets, was sloppily written. You, you didn't have the express rider. I mean, it's, it's obvious that if you have a rider and it says we're not going to pay, we're not going to pay, but you have some that, that did not have the express exclusions. And th- those are the policies that are going to get tested in the courts. Those are the policies that if you didn't have it and you're an insurer, you ought to be paying. Or if you're a reinsurer, you ought to be paying. I think ultimately, though, to your point and to your question, I don't think this pandemic is any different than, you know, kind of what the evolution of what happened after 9-11. Um, and, and that's, you know, you had, you had a, a terrorism act the f- past the, the year after the disaster that, you know, expressly covers, you know, something like 80% of incurred losses above some deductible amount. I, I, I know Berkshire's retention, you know, you know, their, their deductible is something like 1.3 or $1.4 billion and they're covered on all their policies above. Now it doesn't cover reinsurance. It doesn't cover some of the c- commercial lines like auto or burglary surety, I believe. But for their primary business, you know, these specialty lines, very much covered. So that's, you know, $10 billion of their $60 billion in premium volume that is covered by kind of this collective public-private partnership. You know, there's, there's, there's good precedent for that. You take in California, you've got the California Earthquake Authority, for example, that all the insurance companies pay premiums into. And if you have a massive earthquake, you know, that you know, just would wipe out, you know, aggregate, you know, insurance capital, you know, by a factor, you know, you've got this, you've got this public private, this private insurance fund sitting there. You've got the same thing with citizens in Florida. Um, You know, the insurers pay into the, pay into the pool. And it's kind of that, it's kind of your insurer of last resort. So we're going to have to come up with some solution for pandemics going forward. And, you know, hopefully, you know, we, we don't get one, but every, you know, 102 years, but there, there, there's just simply not enough property casualty insurance capital and reinsurance capital to compel and force the the for-profit private sector to bear the risk. So until you get that solution, I'm just not sure who's going to be willing to write, you know, big coverages because, you know, the dollar amounts are, are, are so potentially large and unknown. Chris, do you have specific thoughts on any of the other players, um, Maybe Markel, I don't know if they're um, affected at all and uh, anyone else uh, that, that you've looked at. Yeah, you know, I, I've just always resolved if I'm going to own reinsurers, I, I'd rather do it. Um, I'd rather do it with Berkshire where you've got just this mountain of surplus capital. You know, I, I follow Markel. You know, I like Tom Gaynor a lot. Uh, we, we actually do have a new position in Allegheny this year. You know, Allegheny had a few hundred million dollars in COVID set asides. Markel had some losses. Markel writes, you know, one one of their businesses you know, writes on the the you know, in the Lloyd's market, and some of that business was not written well. So Markel is going to have some losses. So no, you know, I just keep an eye on on kind of the big ones. I mean, Swiss Ray had the two and a half billion. AXA was one point seven billion. Munich Ray just had another uh, you know tack on on their second quarter. I think that, I think they pretty much got it right by, oh, you know, a month or two into the pandemic, but they're like a billion six. Allianz is another billion and a half. Chubb is a billion four. All good insurers. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I stick to more plain vanilla outside of reinsurance. I would rather just own good property casualty insurers and, and, and not the, the reinsurance side of the business. So I've got some auto insurers. I did own Validus um, and we made a mountain of money on Validus, which had gotten spun out of AIG. And ironically, about two years ago, there was a merger between IPC Ray, which is the one that got spun out of AIG, merged with Validus, and then that collective whole just got bought back into AIG a couple of years ago. And I was really sad to see that go because the the the, the folks that were running that business are just outstanding. In fact, you know, uh, kind of you know, note to self and note to anybody that wants to you know live in the minutia of insurance operators, go back and figure out who the guys were that were running that operation, and and at the point where they leave AIG and go do something else that would be a good crew to go follow because, you know, in any of these, 
insurance lines, you've got to be conservative. And we all know from following Berkshire uh, and you know, the, you know those those that do follow the industry, the majority of underwriters don't go, do not do a good job. Cumulative over the years losses uh, ha- have pushed up combined ratios to above a hundred percent for the reinsurance industry. You know, Berkshire is just best of breed, uh, so they've got the income and the earnings that can be developed from the investment portfolio that can be so much more heavily weighted in stocks. You know, Markel's trying to get there. Allegheny has done a good, really good job with capital allocation. Weston Hicks, I think, is you know one of the preeminent insurance guys. Joe Brandon, who had who had run Gen Ray, and you guys, I won't I won't get into the the story, but you know he was kind of outed from Berkshire. Well, Joe is running Transray, which is Allegheny's big reinsurance business, and, and then they've got a specialty writer RSUI. So, you know, if, if you're interested in the insurers, you know, Allegheny is a very good company. It's, I find the stock very undervalued today and also, you know, big beneficiary of this tailwind, at least for the time being, of very hard market and, and very strong pricing. Arch Capital is a pretty good one too, don't you think? I mean, I'm not recommending it, but it's worth looking at if you're interested in the industry. Pretty good management. Yeah, Arch team. is good. I think Aspen had done a good job. You know, they had some weird stuff with mortgage securities, but, you know, they they were acquired. It seems like any of these, you know, the good smaller ones um, have just been gobbled up. CNA for years, you know, the Tish family uh, was kind of held out as an outcast that had not, done, had not done a good job. And we owned CNA a bunch of years ago. You know, they 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 lost a bunch of money in workman's comp and forever. You know, you had a couple of decades where workman's comp cost the industry just a gazillion dollars. Uh, you know, very long tail, developed, you know, a lot worse than than underwriters had thought when all those policies had been written back years ago. You know, I don't think anybody projected that medical costs would rise faster than inflation or even nominal GDP for years and years and years. I don't think anybody could have perceive 30 years back that our society would be as litigious as, as it is. So long tail business like Workman's Comp was a really nasty place to be. It cost Berkshire some money. But lo and behold, here in the last two years, what do you guys think the, the very best line of insurance has been? Uh, workman's Comp. Uh, and so, you know, these things tend to go in cycles. Uh, and I, I just think yeah, there, there are a handful of really good insurers. I'm with you on Arch, I think they do a good job. Uh, and if I couldn't own Berkshire and had to own, you know, a smaller player, I, I think I think they're terrific. Um, I, I don't like the big European insurers, the Swiss Rays, the Munich Rays. You know, you look at, it, I, I just don't like the balance sheets as well. You know, if you look, I, I went through the math of the surplus capital that exists in Berkshire, right? Well, you know, these guys, in my opinion, write way too much premium volume relative to the capital that they have. I mean, you know, Berkshire's reinsurance operations are number four, number five globally in premium volume. Their capital's off the charts. Like I say, it's 40% of the traditional reinsurer's capital. You know, Swiss Ray uh, will write on the order of, you know, $35 billion in premium volume. Well, their capital is about $35 billion. You know, Munich Ray, same, same thing. They write about, you know, they're, they're about the same as Swiss. They, they write premium volume roughly equal to capital. And, you know, in my mind, if you're going to write some of these cat policies that, that can wind up, you know, costing you big sums of money, you better write way less premium volume than you have in statutory capital. I don't think anybody can do it or would need to do it as, as, as severe to the degree that Berkshire does that writes less than, 10, you know, call it 10% of premium volume for each dollar of reinsurance capital. But, you know, the big boys, you know, I would tend to avoid just because if you have a bad tail risk year with, with hurricanes and wind, fires, what have you, thrown on with COVID, those guys are going to have some capital impairment. It's interesting. I, I, you know, the group that I don't know, as I said here and just kind of think out loud, is the Japanese reinsurers are, are probably worth a look. They, they, similar to Berkshire, write very little premium volume for the capital that they have in the businesses. Yeah, I, I just don't know a lot about their underwriting integrity. Um, you know, they tend to not be ones that I follow on a regular basis. But, you know, I will say from you know, just simply conservatism of balance sheet sake, they're probably worth a look. Yeah, I will say too, on your prior point, I don't know anything about them either, unfortunately, but I will say on your prior point, given how much money's come in, low rates, kind of everything going well, and even though the headlines might have you believe that it's been really ugly on the catastrophe side, at least in North America and really in the world writ large, there have been, I think, a relatively few 
uh, major multi-billion dollar catastrophes. There have been more of them by number, I suppose, but the aggregate numbers, the really big ones that that would move the needle have been somewhat lacking in recent years. So the next time we do have a major hurricane hit the East Coast, uh, an earthquake in California or Seattle or something like that, God forbid. But I, I do think whenever that does happen, you're going to see somebody or maybe more than one company really get bit by uh, having written more than they can handle. Well, it, it, you know, if it happens at, at, at a time like we just experienced, uh, and, you know, I say experienced only because the stock market has recovered as much as it has. And thanks to the Federal Reserve, you know, we've kind of compressed credit spreads. But, you know, that, that you know, late first quarter uh, with, you know, the stock market down 30%, credit spreads having blown out until the Fed came to the rescue, you had the unknown of what was going to wind up being, like I said before, you know, a large first half cat loss, which is very unusual. You know, you throw in the further tail risk. So suppose the stock market rolls back over and winds up, winds up down 30, 40, 50%. I don't think that's implausible. You have a bad storm season, a bad name storm season in, in, in the U.S., uh, it could be crippling again, you know, again, if, if you strip and, and I think if you look at aggregate industry data and I don't think the, the folks like S and P and some of the ones that follow the reinsurance industry and the aggregate to me, you'd have to always take Berkshire's business out because it's so capital heavy. If you really want to look and stress test industry capital relative to premium volume and relative to loss trends, relative to combined rates, uh, ratios, you take them out. And so, you know, if we're really at a COVID $80 billion, another four or $5 billion for social unrest, which again, blows my mind, you have a hundred billion dollar storm or a couple big storms or, you know, a couple big storms and an earthquake in California, heaven forbid, you can blow up the, the entire capital base of the reinsurance industry. Um, right. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be pretty. So, you know, these guys are, are getting priced, but I, I can tell you they're collectively holding their breath and hoping that the folks at NOAA and Colorado State, which you know clearly, in my opinion, is not even an opinion; it's it's a fact, is is the is by far the second best university in the state of Colorado, you know, Boulder, <laughs> trumping, of course. But they're absolutely holding their breath that you don't have a tail risk year um, developing, and you know, ho- hopefully, these name storms that you've had make landfall already it is not a precursor precursor to a bad storm year because it's going to be, it's not going to be pretty for many of them, but you know, Berkshire is my largest holding. And again, I, I don't, I've never lost sleep worrying about insurance losses developing inside of Berkshire's portfolio. They just far too overcapitalized. Hey, Chris, uh, before we move uh, to Phil, uh, wondering whether you could give us a little bit of an update on your thinking on uh, the discount to fair value at Berkshire. Yeah, you know, it's it's still wide. I mean, you've had this big move up. Um, you know, market cap got down, I think, below $400 billion. You know, I still think the business is worth $700 billion at today's price. I haven't looked at I mean, You've got, so, so, so Berkshire did, you know, turns out, you guys, I'm sure you guys saw through Mr. Buffett's charitable filing with the SEC that they've probably bought back at least $5 billion worth of shares post- first quarter. Um, I think, um, you know, with this recovery in the stock portfolio, you know, if I had to mark everything to market today, and so 235 billion, if you take Oxy and you take um, Kraft out of the equation, Kraft, by the way, is up 10 or 11% for the year, which is interesting. It's been, you know, pretty dismal for the last three or four years. You know, you've got book value, which is going to wind up being, um, down when they report. I think Berkshire's going to report on Saturday. So I would expect book value to have, it's going to grow considerably given the strength and recovery of the stocks for the quarter. But you know, given that that the portfolio was still down, what did I say, nine and a half percent year to date as of 630, you know, I would think book value, which, you know, may or may not be such a great, you know, barometer of, uh, you know, how you kind of benchmark you're thinking of intrinsic value, but you know, it's going to wind up being down, oh, I don't know, 12, $13 billion, let's say, uh, you know, call it from 425 down to, you know, maybe 412, 13, 14, 15 billion dollars. If you market to market today, it's going to be up for the year. Again, you know, the stock portfolio is back up a half of 1%. 
you've got two quarters now of profitability that is going to be below what I would call normalized profitability. Again, the MSR group is going to be, you know, weak in terms of reported profits. The rail is going to be down for the second quarter, at least 25%. So, you know, you're still going to have, you know, book um, up nominally for the year. And so, you know, at what I would call, you know, I, I, so I, I lean on, if you, if you jump through all of the hoops that I go through to, nor, to, to normalize earning power, in my mind, you know, I had 40 to $42 billion in, in normalized earning power for Berkshire at year end. Um, you know, I, I, could, I could, I mean, you make the case that they're not going to spend a ton of the cash, although they are spending cash. Uh, again, the share repurchases, you, you, everybody's seeing the, 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 the filings. Uh, for B of A, where they're increasing the position side, you know, so my guess is they've been fairly active in the stock market. You know, I think um, the the notion of buying back stock in earnest once once we're a little bit more clear that the economy uh, is on its way to recovery, I think you know changes the thinking inside Mr. Buffett's head as to whether he's willing to deploy capital or whether he needs to sit on a, a mountain of cash reserves. So, you know, at 15 times normalized earning power, 40 billion, let's say that's $600 billion and you're at 480 ish today, 490, let's say. Uh, you know, I think fair value in my mind is closer to $700 billion, but that gets you to 18 times normalized earning power. Do we trade at that number? I don't know, but when the stock was trading at 1.1 times book a couple of weeks ago for a business that earns 10 on equity, business that earns 10 on equity is not worth 1.1 1 1. 1 to book. I mean, you know, it's, so I'll earn 10 a year at my price two weeks ago, and I'll make some accretion when the stock trades north of 110 a book. If the earning power of the business is diminished, and we're going to earn, call it 8% on, on the book equity of the business, and then you're looking at 32, 33, 34 billion dollars in earning power, you know, and the stock, you know, would be worth 110, 120% of book. So if I hold it for a decade or 15 years, I'm going to make eight. And if it still trades at 110 a book and it's, you know, I'm, I'm marking it to market at 110, you know, I'm going to make the ROE. Um, so, you know, I think eight would be the absolute worst case expected return for a 10 or 15 year horizon. And you can get to numbers if the stock really does start to move up to 150 of book, 160 a book, and the world gets more comfortable that they're really earning 10 on equity. You know, depending on how long it takes to get there, you've got a double digit return. And, you know, for that intrinsic value is worth a lot more than the current $492 billion bid in, in my mind. Great. Well, let's go over to you, Phil. Uh, I know you wanted to uh, highlight some recent news and tie that into the discussion of uh, corporate governance. Yeah, first, I mean, unfortunately, since we're already on the uh, downside of all these horrible stories in the news. I don't know if you saw this, Chris, but uh, there was a real tragedy yesterday or the day before in Tennessee with uh, Jim Clayton and his brother and two other people were in a helicopter that crashed in Tennessee. And unfortunately, uh, Joe, the co-founder of the business, uh, didn't didn't survive. I think the other three did survive. But um, really sad after you know all the stuff we were just talking about. I want to make note of that and pass along condolences as well. That's really horrible. I, I Good news, uh, switching topics, is that we do, I think, have our first guest coming up in a couple of weeks, unless there's somebody planned for next week. But I think John will have, uh, Larry Cunningham will be joining us in a couple of weeks, which will be a great conversation. He's going to be sharing um, his latest book and his latest research, which I think everybody should pay close attention to. He's one of the best uh, writers and thinkers and truly an expert in corporate governance in all possible ways, having studied very closely, uh, very directly, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett for many decades, and now as vice chairman of Constellation Software and working hand in hand with Mark Leonard, um, another all time great. I think Larry's perspective and insights are second to none, and you're going to really enjoy hearing from him. Uh, so, with that in mind, I mean, I think we'll we'll revisit this when he comes in. But I just wanted to touch briefly on something that caught my eye this week, which really just blew my mind. Um, so when Apple reported earnings uh, <clears throat> some days ago, they also announced a four for one stock split, um, which you know I was hoping had kind of gone the way of the dodo bird. You just don't see it very much anymore. It's obviously a nonsensical, antiquated practice. And so it really caught my eye that one of the very biggest, most successful companies the world has ever seen decided that it needed to split its stock. And when I looked at the press release, 
it says, we decided to split our stock because we want Apple stock to be more accessible to a broader base of investors. And so then I look at the numbers, okay. So they have 4.3 billion shares of common stock outstanding. And after this split, they will have 17.1 billion shares of common stock outstanding. So it kind of defies you know, logic that this could really be the reason. And, and I think it just gets back to this notion that in so many ways, corporate governance and investor, relation, investor relations are still just stuck in this weird dark ages mentality where this sort of thing is, is at all necessary or at all meaningful. So I, I don't mean to be too critical of Apple. It's a great company in, in almost every way. Um, you know, certainly uh, they do almost everything right, but this one just kind of blows my mind. So I did look it up and I, I had a little fun pulling down all the companies in the S&P 500. So if you look at Apple on a couple of different metrics, um, if you look at their average daily volume to their total number of shares outstanding, so a measure of the turnover in the stock, um, they, you know, despite being one of the bigger stocks in the S&P 500, they actually only rank 235th in terms of turnover. But by no means does that seem to imply a need to increase that turnover. They're actually turning over the entire shareholder roster twice per year. Um, so presumably now with the increased shares, they'll be turning it over even more than that. What benefit from that they'll get is unclear. Why, why they'll need to increase the churn in their shareholder base, why that should be a goal of the company is, of course, totally unclear. Um, and then interestingly enough, if you then go sort the share price, just the dollar price of every stock in the S&P 500, they actually ranked uh, 22nd. So by no means was there you know, some weird thing distorting Apple that was unique to Apple itself. Um, number one company, some people might know, if not, it's a great company. It's a home builder. Actually, NVR uh, had a share price approaching $4,000 a share. Uh, number two is a company people might have heard of, Amazon, share price over $3,000 a share. And Amazon, by the way, joins Apple in the trillion dollar market club. And Amazon has split its shares a few times, but I think it has become obvious with a share price over $3,000 a share that they no longer view that as a necessary practice. <laughs> and it certainly hasn't uh, impeded their progress or their interactions with the equity market to have a high dollar price share. And, and you know, so it was amazing too. There was an article written in the Wall Street Journal. Again, I hate to pick on the Wall Street Journal because I love it. Uh, I really do. But there was an article written about the Apple share split which I think points to some psychological factors that are worth considering. And the title of it was Stock, Spit, Stock Splits Pay Off on the Rare Occasions They Occur. And it seemed to imply some sort of causation between stock splits and the share price going up over time, particularly going up around the period of announcement as it just did with Apple, which of course gets it potentially backward or, or you know, forsaking correlation and causation at the very best. Um, and, and if you just go read this article, I mean, it will just make your head spin. And then if you really want to get a headache, go click into the comments section, which I know is the number one rule of the internet, never read the comments. But um, I couldn't help myself in this case, just to see what the, the peanut gallery would have to say about this. And it really just takes you into a very um, mind bending place in terms of the logic that people ascribe to this move. So I, you know, I guess the lesson and the takeaway for me um, was that even great companies get things wrong sometimes. It doesn't make them bad or evil or terrible or anything. But again, even the best screw up this very basic thing. And I guess I just can't understand why companies can't focus back on what really matters, which is that they need to be cultivating their long-term shareholder base not pandering to whatever this result hopes to achieve. You know, if Apple does a good job running the company, the shareholder, or the share price will certainly take care of itself. And with a little bit of care and feeding, the shareholder base um, will be in a much better place than it is today. And instead, this is at best neutral, and in my opinion, a significant negative in that effort. So uh, I think the lesson and the takeaway for me was that it just takes years and decades of patience and baby steps to make any sort of progress in this direction. I mean, I guess it, the one positive what it, it points out, and I assume these, these numbers are legitimate, was that the um, there's only been three companies so far in 2020 
I presume this is U.S. listed companies in the Wall Street Journal article. Just three companies, including Apple, have unveiled plans for a for a split of their shares this year. That's down from 102 companies in 1997 um, and seven that that split their shares a few years ago in 2016. I don't know why they picked those years, but again, clearly this is something that has become a, a increasingly rare practice in corporate America and hopefully it'll continue to be increasingly rare. So this one odd duck really stood out, but I think it points to the fact that progress in this era, in this, in this area is really haltingly slow and you you can't wish for everything all at once. You just have to make very incremental baby steps as you go. Well, it's been, it's been an issue that's bothered me to, to no end over the duration of my career. And I mean, if you go back to the nineties and you know, the, the raging bull market in, in stocks and tech stocks. I mean, you, you had the point where, to, to your point, th- th- these things were happening on the most regular of bases. Right. I think half the world actually believed that a stock split was good for you. Didn't understand that you're, you know, swapping a $20 bill for two tens. And I had meeting after meeting with some of my more retail oriented clients that wanted to know what we were doing about trying to find companies that were going to split their stock. The most absurd thing. Um, you know, and then along came, we talked about a little bit last week, but when Berkshire issued the B shares, you know, I think there were some, you know, there were clearly some compelling reasons to do that. And he never, there were, yeah, there are exceptions, right? That was one, right. He said he never wanted to split the stock, but you know, you had, you had those guys that were going to knock them off and, and start making the price point more accessible through unit trust. And so we issued with the a B fee, shares. right. With a fee yeah. and potentially so, not replicating it. Right. Yeah. I mean, back then, the if I remember, I mean, for years, the estate tax exemption per person was six hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, between a couple, husband and wife, one point two million. But the gift tax exclusion underneath that, which today is fifteen thousand dollars, was ten thousand dollars. And so, you know, you could give money to your kids or to whomever. Each of them, you could give to ten thousand dollars, and that ten per person. So you could do it, and your wife could do it. And you can give to each of your kids. So between, you know, you can give your daughter 20000 you can give your son 20000 But you had issues when Berkshire's share price had gotten up to north of the uh, gift tax exclusion. And so, you know, a split there, or at least issuing the second class of shares made sense. But this notion that, that Apple came out with to, to make the price point more accessible, the it's, reason this yeah. thing is really bothering me in a is if you think about it, and, and I've and 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 I and I started watching the bid ask spread for this very reason because I've always believed and I know I'm right and I'm sure there's academic research that tells you if if you take Apple's shares and split them four for one I would say over the last week or so week and a half that I've been paying attention to this the bid ask has ranged every time I've popped it up on a couple of my monitors between four and fourteen cents per share so you know, maybe it's averaged eight cents. Well, if you split the stock volume, the number of shares traded, if you assume, you know, constant dollar flows, volume is going to go up 4X, but the dollar volume doesn't change. You know, the volume of shares goes up. And so I can guarantee you, because I've observed this, if the range of bid ask was four cents to 14 cents, it ain't going to go to one cents to three and a half cents. And so the retail investor is going to wind up paying more on a per share basis on the bid ask. The market maker is going to, going to scoop up more. And then you think about in the retail brokerage world, the discount brokers of all here in the last six months cut their commission schedules to zero. And I've watched right. you know, Schwab, who we use as a custodian for, for some of our family accounts and, and retail accounts. You know, I've seen those commissions decline steadily over the course of my career. You know, it used to be you know, $45 per trade and then you know, X number of cents per commission. And then it was $39 and then it was $9 and then it was $4 and 99 cents. And, you know, eventually now they've got commissions down to zero and there's no minimum. So, you know, if you've fractional got shares four, too, you don't even you do fractional argument. shares. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're a young investor, you ought have 450 bucks lined up before you're going to buy Apple. Otherwise you ought to own yeah. a more diversified portfolio. Correct. And so, you know, but if, if if you're still beholden to the world, and I've got you know plenty of clients that have you know bank custodians and prime brokers, where you know we're still paying X number of cents commission per share. Well, if I'm paying four cents a share, I mean, you just just think through. I mean, let's let's say you want to put a hundred thousand dollars to work in Apple, 
And at the price here of 445, I got to buy, what is that? 225 shares. So at four cents a share, that's nine bucks, right? So you split that sucker four for one. Now I got to buy 900 shares at what's 445 divided by four, one, 111 and a quarter. So if I'm still paying four cents a share, now my commission has just jumped up from $9 to 36 cents. So throw in a higher bid ask spread, throw in a higher commission. And now instead of paying 27 bucks, you know, on the trade, I'm paying 72, 2.7 basis points versus it would be, you know, on a hundred, it'd be 7.2, you know, seven, seven, 7.2 basis points. The area where the retail investor is really getting screwed. If you think about a TD Ameritrade or you think about an E-Trade or a Schwab client or a Vanguard client or Fidelity, you're not paying any commissions. Bothers me exponentially. I mean, my, it makes my skin crawl that when I place an order today, I'm getting front run when right. the brokerage firm sells my order for order, it sells my order flow. And I got Citadel or Virtue or any of these guys trading in front of me. I mean, this ought to be illegal. It's been banned in a lot of countries and it is disgusting. I don't even know what it is. If it's one cent per share, well, good. Apple, you just split the stock four for one. Now that's four cents per share that's getting kicked back at some level to the brokerage firm. And it's just BS. I mean, it, it's beyond the pale. You're not helping the retail investor. You're screwing the retail investor by splitting the stock. And that's a just it's just absolutely wrong. And it, the, the practice had gone away. There's, there's no compelling reason to do it in a world of zero or low or no commissions, but you've just exponentially increased the take for the wholesale market maker. I mean, that guy is going to pay, you know, he, he's going to kick back the bid ass spread, which is not going to be cut by 25% on a four for one split. Again, like I say, you know, that, that bid ass spread, when you guys look at it after they affect the spread, it ain't going to be four cents to fourteen cents. You know, it might be, you know, half that. You know, you, you so you're going to you know you're going to double the cost on that component. Um, you know, you're going to get a little bit of a kickback to the retail investor for price improvement, but most of it's paid for order flow uh, to the market maker, and you know they're going to make a profit on that. And it's detrimental to no end. And it, it may sound like just a few dollars. I mean, on that hundred thousand share, if the commission was nine dollars and you know, now it's going to be $36. You think, well, so what? It's two and a half or seven and a half basis points. It's nothing. But you multiply that by every share that's traded on the stock market. And these people are getting rich. So way to go, Apple. You just screwed your retail shareholder big time. The people that want to buy and transact in your shares. And not only that, I just don't, it, it defies logic and reason that they would want shareholders to come and go more frequently or be able to come and go more frequently. Or, or again, there's no tie. There's certainly no tie. They don't even try to make a connection to this contributing to a more rational share price. I mean, I would argue there's not a man, woman, or child on planet Earth that hasn't heard of Apple that that should otherwise have heard of Apple and, and could somehow contribute to the investment community's knowledge of Apple or the pricing efficiency of Apple. And this certainly does nothing in that end. So it just defies belief that they would have done this. But again, you know, here we are. and. Um, you know, it's a good one for the psychology of human misjudgment, which we'll we'll revisit for over over time, I'm sure. But uh, it certainly well, you stands know, out. Well, you know, their treasurer and their CFO has has their their bankers whispering in their ear about the intelligence of the split. And you, know, you think about you think about the dollar volume of share repurchases that Apple makes, and I wonder if they realize that we're in the last two, three, four years when they're spending more than a hundred percent of their net income buying back their stock. I mean, they've been spending 70 plus billion dollars per year buying back the shares. You, th- you think those trades are being sold and, and somebody's getting paid for order flow in, fl- in front of that? Um, I, I bet right, they are. They're not dumb. So that's why it's just, it defies, you know, boggles the mind that they would fall for that sales pitch for any, for some sort of specious reason. That reason I just, you know, they're, they're obviously, again, I don't think they're doing this out of outright, um, you know, bad intentions. I don't think they're doing it. On, it's just, it's sort of one of these odd antiquated practices that grew out of bizarre Wall Street sales culture and why it worked here and why it happened is just hard to understand. But uh, I'm with you. Believe yeah, me. I, think the Google, I think the Google guy sat with Mr. Buffett and they've tried to emulate the way he's conducted 
his governance and his affairs. And, you know, they, they sat and listened to the logic of not splitting the stock and the benefits that then would inure to not only the long-term shareholder, but really to the ones that do want to transact in the shares. That's true. But they also split the stock before and they, they actually did another split where, you know, they created a dual class. So when part of the reorganization and so, you know, you can debate whether that was good, bad, or neutral for the non-controlling minority shareholders. And again, I don't think this is something that should be regulated or banned outright. There are good exceptions and reasons why. And again, in the Berkshire case, a big part of the split when it went from, when he created the bees was kind of to bust up those trusts that were selling mini Berkshire shares. And then when they split the uh, uh, B shares uh, 50 for one, it was part of the uh, BNSF merger was because they didn't want uh, small minority shareholders in BNSF to get a, to get a raw deal and have to accept cash when they otherwise didn't want it. So uh, there are good reasons to split shares. Um, I just, this one, it does not seem to have any of those good reasons attached to it. Kind of switching up for a second. Now that that Apple has has risen so dramatically, and in Berkshire's case, is 110 billion dollars. Uh, when I looked at it midday today, 45 percent of the common stock portfolio in Berkshire's case, it's as big relative to the portfolio as Coca Cola was in 1998. Do you have any thoughts on you know Apple here at a 1.9 trillion dollar market cap? I mean, for the better part of the last decade, if you looked at the fundamentals simply on paper. It wasn't that it wasn't that expensive. I mean, it traded for a mid-teens multiple to to earnings, and you know they've maintained their profit margin, which is mystifying to me. They've ballooned sales up to I don't know they're going to be three hundred billion dollars in the next year or two at a twenty percent margin. That's sixty billion dollars in profit, probably a little more in free cash profit. But at a one point nine trillion cap, I mean, you're thirty plus times you're thirty times what they might earn in twenty their their, their year twenty twenty one. You know, at, at, yeah, I'm no, I'm no expert either. I it does look, uh, you know, it's certainly not the bargain it once was. I mean, Buffett loaded up on it and got a good result so far. I think it's ironic that people seem so eager to wish him off as a dinosaur when he certainly nailed this one, and the dollars earned here so far have far outweighed anything else. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't. It is a gigantic company. It's a powerful company. How much can it continue to grow at this size? I think that's the most important question, and I don't have any differentiated answer on that. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be hard, but I wouldn't wouldn't want to bet against Apple either. It's going to be interesting to see what, if anything, he does with the position now that it is so big. I mean, you know, just right. just the unrealized gain so far at 110 billion cap. I'm not. I don't remember what the cost basis is, but I mean, it's got to be. You know, he's he's got to be damn near having tripled the position. So you know, you think about if my take on normalized earning power is forty billion dollars, you've made two years worth of Berkshire's entire earning power just in the capital gain of the Apple shares during the short tenure of their ownership. It's a remarkable thing. Yeah, hard hard to say he doesn't own tech and you know that he's lost his touch on the investing front. I mean, this thing so far right. has been a home run, but right. at some point, you know, it becomes such a big component of the of the entirety uh, he's been so unwilling to pay capital gains taxes within the stock portfolio proven to you know swap entire subsidiaries um, and, and, and not pay tax by Gen Ray in 1998 to really diversify stocks by picking up Gen Ray's bond portfolio I'm intrigued to see how the Apple position evolves I mean a whether the shares continue to rise or you know stay at these levels, and if there's any activity out of Omaha, the inter- yeah, I'm curious to see. Sure. Yeah, I would. My guess would be that he would let it be for now, but at least that's how he's treated these in the past. These types of situations in the past, unless something dramatic has changed in his evaluation of the business, which I would doubt it. I mean, it's possible, but that would seem unlikely. And uh, for all the reasons you mentioned, it'd be somewhat difficult to trim it in meaningful size on short. On a short-term basis, it'd be expensive in terms of taxes, uh, not to mention <laughs> the frictional costs that are now going up with the number of shares. I mean, how many how many shares is he going to own? How many billion shares is he going to have at the end? <laughs> so it'd be difficult to get out of it in any hurry. And uh, I think if he still believes in the long-term power of the business, he'll probably let it sit tight, particularly given all the cash he's already sitting on. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. You know, um, who knows what the thing is going to wind up being, but if, as we get closer to the election, if it continues to look like 
Biden's going to wind up winning. And, you know, if the Republicans lose control of the Senate, then a lot of the aspects of the tax code changes that we saw at the end of 2017 will be reversed. I think the Biden proposal has the marginal corporate tax rate bumping up from 21 to either 28 or 29 percent. And so, you know, I guess if, if, if there ever was a time to take some realized gains and pay them at 21 percent and you think that rate's going to move some some degree higher, I suppose now would be the time to do it here in the next few months. Yeah, that's a fair point. And that could be true, but I I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I mean, I will say back to your prior point though about uh, the Google Alphabet founders having consulted Omaha so directly in their process and having evolved and changed in their practices because of it. It is kind of stunning to think that you have the world's best investor as your lead shareholder and that someone at Apple didn't maybe run this by him or if they did run it by him, then acted contrary to what his advice would have been. I mean, this doesn't fall to the USG level level of uh, malpractice where they didn't consult him about a takeover offer that they had received. <laughs> but uh, it is just kind of hard to believe. I mean, I know he ducks to Tim Cook somewhat regularly and uh, this may or may not have ever reached Tim Cook's desk before it was somewhat already down the down the road, but uh, it's just kind of a head scratcher from start to finish. Well, Tim's bottom line has has certainly <laughs> improved for the better. You know, they lean really heavily on on share grants and RSUs, and it's really unusual in that I think 100% of the performance hurdles are all tied to the performance of the stock versus oh, yeah. something like 350 of the companies that make up the S&P 500. So, you know, they've been cooking that. So they're earning at the max levels of performance grants. And, you know, his shares have taken him not as a founder owner, but as a, you know, hired gun. Oh, yeah. His yeah. ownership stake is now well north of a billion dollars, which is remarkable. Yep. And I, in general, by the way, I mean, again, I'm not the world's leading expert on Apple, but I think he's done a great job. I mean, I think he inherited a very tough job and then he's been dealt numerous curveballs along the way. And I think he's handled a lot of it as well as you could expect or hope any CEO to do. So I think, and I certainly don't have any broad criticisms of him as a CEO. Um, you know, corporate governance and compensation, all that stuff is a separate nuanced discussion. But in general, it's hard to give him a bad grade. That's for sure. Phil, if you had to guess, or John, you had to guess, if you had to come up with, a, you know, assuming they make no acquisitions, just a organic top line sales growth rate over the next decade, I would conjecture that it's going to be mid single digits. You had three or four years in the last five or six where there wasn't a lot of sales growth. And then with this latest upgrade cycle, they've kind of gone through the roof again. But you know, if you're growing off a 260 to $300 billion base and you've got to reinvent your product category in its entirety with every, with every new model, they've proven great ability to raise prices. Um, remarkable, you know, far, far better than I would have thought. I mean, I think the latest 11 is $1,100 all in, you know, for the top of the line model. Also be interested to see how much of their uh, revenues that come through the app store wind up being sticky at the rates that they're currently getting on the take. You know, I wonder if there's not some price com- compression to be given back there, but yeah, you're right. I mean, he's done a rock star of a job growing this business from, um, of a shadow of what it was just a decade ago. It's stunning to me to see it sitting here pushing $300 billion in revenues. It's a big, big number. So what do you, what do you say? 5% over the next how long on top line growth? I would guess if I had to bet, if you, if you, if you assume no acquisitions and, you know, forget about sales per share, but you know, if, if you're going to grow off, let's say today's sales base is 270 billion, 280 billion, I would bet they grow that the, they might be able to grow sales at five percent. I wouldn't bet on a number north of five. Yeah, it's a tough one. That's probably right where I would put the over under. And again, I would acknowledge back to our conversation last week that you're kind of off the grid in terms of the base rate here. You've never had a company this big grow at a level that would exceed double digits. I would think I'd want to go check the the data on that, but I can't imagine a company from this starting point has ever grown at that kind of rate over any meaningful period, let's call it the next five or 10 years. So yeah, I certainly wouldn't take the over on five, but um, you know, there's pricing power there that the, you know, there's very high margin revenue that comes through the ecosystem. Yeah. I don't know. That's a, that's a really tough one. What do you think, John? 
Too tough for me, uh, but I have kind of noted with some interest uh, some of the controversies around the App Store and the commissions that Apple uh, extracts there. So it seems like uh, there's a lot of uh, pent-up dissatisfaction uh, with Apple among a lot of the uh, the companies that have their apps uh, in the App Store. And it may not mean anything, but I think Apple is really exercising its market power. And, uh, and it shows the moat that it has, but it also kind of opens the door to some disruption potentially. And, you know, a decade is a really long time in, uh, in that kind of a market. So sure yeah. really tough to say uh, where that's going to go. But um, if the smaller players that rely on the App Store had their say, I'm sure there would be some compression uh, on the margin there. I would also take the... The supposition in the question about assuming no acquisitions, <laughs> I would bet very strong. I think we just kind of reached the point in the corporate life cycle where all that cash piling up, law of large numbers working against you, I would bet strongly in favor of some pretty significant acquisitions in the next 10 years for Apple, assuming they're allowed to for antitrust purposes. But from a purely just sort of psychological and corporate history perspective, I think this is the part of the show where they start making a lot of acquisitions unless something unusual happens. It'll be interesting to watch the overall, you know, all the various capital allocation levers they can pull, you know, whether they do deals, whether they keep buying back stock at the rate they are. I mean, they've bought back a third of the shares in the last decade. Um, You know, we're going to find out very quickly how, discriminate or indiscriminate they are in terms of the price they're willing to pay for their shares. We just looked this up and you know, in the last nine months, they've already bought back $55 billion. So they're still clipping along, buying back shares at, at multiple of their profit each year and spending something like 25 to 30% of their revenues buying back stock. Um, you know, if the stock is, you know, fairly now at a overvalued level, what do you do? I think the intent was to buy back stock to you know kind of work the cash balance down to where it matched the debt balance. Um, but you know, back to the masterful capital allocators, you know, if the stock is expensive, can you get somebody to take it as currency in a deal as well? So you know, they they have the high class problem of throwing off a mountain of free cash. It doesn't take that much money to gear up each new iteration of product cycle. And so you know, a company that's just generating as much cash as they are proving you know successful i think for as many years as the stock was cheap uh relative to fundamentals you know buying back stock at intelligent prices seeing what they do from here Um, but if they can continue at the level of repurchases that they've been making i mean if you know that five percent is the over under on sales growth that's not to say that the common shareholder can't have a better experience than matching sales growth you know you retire another 30 your shares and you take the share count down from I guess what 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 was 4.3 billion to you know over 17 billion you know they take the share count down to 10 billion over the next 7 8 9 years um you know as long as you're not massively overpaying for the shares um you know shareholder can still have a pretty good ride with it I suppose maybe they could give uh, Buffett a call and see if they can just buy Berkshire's shares that's possible <laughs> Well, I think we'll leave it there, guys. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the insights today. Uh, we uh, we had a great conversation, and uh, we'll have the crew back together next week. Looking forward to getting uh, Elliot uh, into the mix again as well. Thanks so much. Okay, good talking to you guys. See you next week. Thanks, Talk guys. To you next week. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.